Good day, everyone. Dr. Blood here. Okay, time to finish this thing. But first, a slightly controversial comment before we start. She does not have schizophrenia. I'm sorry, Zenpai. A quick recap of what these videos are about. I will make a psychological analysis of operators, making use of all canon information I can find about them. This time, we'll be analyzing the second half of the Ursus self-governing group, going from the members with fewer issues to the ones with more delicate symptoms. If you want to see the first half, you can click in the link above. The goal is to figure out what ills them and suggest the best treatment for them. Medication will be limited to those cases where it is indispensable for treatment to continue. So, with that out of the way, let us continue. This is a psychological analysis of Arknight's operators. The next one on our list is someone who on the surface appears to be mentally stable. Yet if you look closer, we will see that she is far from it. The oh biggest my. student in Rhodes, Rosa. Natalia Andreyevna Rostova, a former noble of Chernobyl and probably the older member of the group. As we could see in the Children of Ursus event, she was the leader of the noble faction in Peterheim, and while she wanted to keep order as much as possible, she was unable to fully rein in those in her group. And after the burn of the Secor Pantry, Rosa came to the realization that she never had any power to begin with. And if anything, all she did was increase the tensions between nobles and commoners, leaving her with the feelings of guilt and regret. While she acclimated well on roads, there were those who didn't see eye to eye with Ursa's nobility, and let her know in various degrees of aggression. To the point Istina had to shield her in one event. Despite this, Rosa shown no ill will towards those actions. If anything, she appeared to be willing to receive safe punishment head on, while also letting go of her noble status. Since she sees herself as guilty of what happened back in Chernobyl. That's right, just like in Istina's case, Rosa shows symptoms of survival's guilt. But while Istina's feelings are aimed at Sima, Rosa's are aimed entirely at herself. You could say she is more of the regular kind of survival's guilt, but as everything in Terra, things are not that simple. We can see that Rosa's blame doesn't stop on pointing out her shortcomings but also include deprecating thoughts and feelings of inadequacy. This is why she didn't care about the harsh words coming from the Ursu personnel, and also why she wished Sima had finished the job back when they met. So analyzing her guilt alongside her deprecating thoughts and even suicidal thoughts, I diagnose Rosa with survival guilt and depression. Depression is stated as, quote, more than just sadness. People with depression might experience a lack of interest and pleasure in daily activities, significant weight loss or gain, insomnia or excessive sleeping, lack of energy, inability to concentrate, feelings of worthlessness or excessive guilt, and recurrent thoughts of death or suicide. This is the reason behind her position in the list. Depression is one of the more delicate states of mind around, but also one of the more recurrent with a 3.8% of the whole world being affected by it, and those are the ones we know of. So it wouldn't be that big of a deal, right? First of all, no. Second, in psychology, while recurrent and delicate, depression is something most specialists in mental health will often find, so it might become part of their routine. However, the moment a suicidal thought comes into view, the individual's case become a high priority one with different talks having a respective level depending on the type. Level 1. Ideation. When people think about it in passing. Level 2. Planning. When people are actually deciding how to make an attempt. Level 3. Intent. When they procure the means needed for an attempt. Level 4. Imminent. When they have all intention to perform an attempt. Level 5. Critic. There has been an attempt. We know Rosa is at least a level 4. She almost went and did it, but thought it would be a hassle for those around her. Thus, she stopped. 
the fact her guilt is strong enough to cut her to such a point makes her high risk case. While she stops herself, nothing tells us she wouldn't try again should things become too much for her. Think Inception. Once the doubt is there, it can grow like an infection. Her depression is a risk to herself, however, she is able to fake it thanks to her novel training in dialogue and speech, thus making it hard for others to notice. In fact, had it not been because of her talk with Sima, we would have known in the first place her facade is that good. Then why is she not at the bottom of the list? Well, that's because of her own merits to walk away from it. Not like Leto, mind you. It is not that she was able to power through her issues or work through them on her own, but because of one of the more basic principles in psychological treatment, the support net. It's just a fancy name for friends and family, individuals who care for the patient and who look after them, making sure they are doing well both physically and mentally. This is why her work at Rhodes is so important. While she did it at first as atonement, the bonds she formed with her co-workers and the rest of the girls is what made her think her action more carefully. It was the thought of not wanting to cause trouble to save the individuals what stopped her. We also know through her files that she confessed to the doctor her thoughts and experiences on Peterheim, yet as always, we didn't get a clear picture of how much she said. But what matters is that she did, and that is a very important first step. And while she didn't say anything specific regarding the rest of the girls, she at least mentioned how they need help as well. Again, why this psychological war that roads do nothing is beyond me. Moving on. Having analyzed Rosa's information, the treatment I can suggest is behavioral activation treatment, which is, quote, an intervention that explicitly aims to increase an individual's engagement in valued life activities through guided goals setting to bring about improvements in thoughts, moods, and quality of life. BAT is meant to increase the activity levels of the patient into working through new experiences as to work through their traumatic experiences. As mentioned before, these events won't disappear, but at least it will help them to move forward. In principle, Rosa is already beginning with something similar to her decision to stay at Rhodes, and then moving to the front. I wouldn't call it the smartest of moves, but again, 14 year old. So the treatment will help Natalia move past her guilt and let go of her sick for atonement. If she wants to help others, it shouldn't be because she sees it as punishment, but because she wants to. Also. This is the kind of case where I would suggest medication should her depressive state return. Depression isn't something one can ignore. If therapy isn't enough, do not doubt to ask a professional for a description. They are meant to help you with your treatment. Now, we move from a depressed bear to an aggressive one. The one we all been waiting for. The Winter General Sima. What to live by? Sonia, leader of the USSGG, as well as the main reason the group survived as long as they did, while also being the reason things escalated as they did. But we are not here to blame, as Istina herself pointed out, had it not been her, someone else would have pushed everyone over the edge one way or another. Just so happens that it was Sima who had the displeasure to get inside honor. Backing up a bit, we know that Sima had a somewhat dysfunctional life back at Chernobyl. The only daughter of a commoner family, with a father who apparently didn't expect much from her, and a mother who, on the other hand, was quite supportive of her. It is quite possible that most of Sima's positive points were inherited or nurtured by her mother. When the takeover of Peterheim started, Sima stayed on her own helping those being abused by others whenever she happens to pass by. Although, always in a distant and abrasive way as to keep everyone at bay, already showing her most prominent defense mechanism, reaction formation, which is, quote, a defense mechanism in which unacceptable or threatening unconscious impulses are denied and are replacing consciousness with their opposite. Sima's thought act is a way for her to keep herself safe, because she cannot be a weakling 
if she doesn't depend on others. Therefore, she is strong enough to endure her surroundings. For some time, this tactic working in keeping her alone, but eventually, someone come and forced her to do otherwise. Christina. The reason partially being her old connection with her, as she was already an old friend of Sima. Thus, her subconscious couldn't just chart her off as another lost kid and was forced to acknowledge her existence. While acting reluctant about it, this made Sonia happy. As she finally had something to protect, she could finally act as her mother wished for. However, and as Sima herself points out, she is not good at talking, but she is good at punching. And while simply knocking foes unconscious was enough when on her own, now she had to worry not only for herself, but also for those behind her. Knocking people out was no longer enough. We don't know when or where did Sima manage to get a hold of her axe, but we know she put it to use. Repeatedly. Rationalizing her actions as needed in order to keep everyone safe. Something which gives meaning to her violence, but a sense of pride and accomplishment does not keep a stomach full. Thus happened the event which Zima will go to regret to this day. Back to the present, we see Zima at home in Rhodes as an operator, having yet another use for her violence. After all, there are people still needing her protection, but the events of Peterheim didn't leave her alone. We can see how Zima's nights are plagued by recurring nightmares. We know this because Istina mentions how often she has problems to sleep, say dreams are plague of all sort of memory Sima tries to repress, yet her subconscious keep bringing back in a mocking manner, literally. Her guilt of her past took the shape of a mirror image of herself, repeatedly admonishing her for her action. I would like to point out that, while painted as a malicious entity, this mirror Sima shouldn't be seen as evil. If Sima sees her as such, it's because she's pointing out at the truth she is so desperately trying to deny. This can be seen in the thoughts it has with Sima's concept of Istina, which can be interpreted as the hidden wish she has of coming clean with her friend. This mirror being is none other than her conscience, given form by her subconscious in a way to make her face reality and stop running from it. However, and as mentioned before, Sima's mind's defense mechanism is the complete opposite. Her go-to reaction is to deny it. The bigger example of this is shown at the end of the dream, where imaginary versions of the girls recriminate her actions, yet Sima counters each argument with the same approach, to deny their words to justify her actions. All of them, but one. She can be told she's a monster, that she should die, that it was all her fault, she will take it head on. But the moment Istina says just three words to her, she breaks down. Remember how I said in the previous video that Istina was called dependent of Sima? I didn't say dependent, as that would require only one individual. What they have is codependency. Because as much as Istina needs to support Sima, Sima needs to protect Istina. Or at least, what she represents. The good Sima can become. But why Istina? Because she was her friend? Because she was the one who suggested her to be the leader? Because she's the one she can rely on? Or maybe something more primal? No, not like that. To explain what I meant, let us return to the beginning of Sima's dream, back to her house where a little bit of information was given, yet so fast some of us might have missed it. Sonia's mother's name was Anna. Sonia's mother and its Tina share the same name. Can you see Freudianism? Sima's mother was the one who expected the best from her. Istina is the one who gave her a way to become such an individual. This is a bit of a reach, but I think that for Sima, Istina represents the goodness in her life, not romantically, mind you. This is why, of all people, Istina's words carry the more weight. 
just three words, and the general is no more. This is what Nerl meant by her toad act being a fragile shell. This is why she goes face first into danger. This is why she shouts, do not be afraid. She is not encouraging her fellow operators. She's ordering herself to do not panic. Sima is in total denial of her reality. Not in a way that causes her to lose hold of it, mind you, as that is something an actual schizophrenic will do. But that doesn't mean she is entirely grounded. In her mind, she has to be the strongest one, so no one can hurt those behind her. She has to be the one on top, so no one plots against her. She has to be the Winter General. Otherwise, she will just be Sonia, a normal girl who couldn't do more during Peterheim. With all of this in consideration, I diagnose Sima with denial of her PTSD and trauma, and the treatment I suggest for the general is Gestalt therapy, specifically of the empty chair variety. According to the APA, Gestalt is, quote, a form of psychotherapy in which the central focus is on the totality of the client's functioning and relationships on the here and now, rather than on investigation, past experiences and developmental history. One of the themes is that growth occurs by assimilation of what is needed for the environment and that psychopathology arises as a disturbance of contact with the environment. Gestalt techniques can be applied in either a group or an individual setting, are designed to bring out spontaneous feelings and self-awareness, and promote personality growth. Her current mentality has no focus later on the future, barely in the present, and definitely none for the past. Yet her defensive mechanism will shut down most intents to help her as she will deem them as prying into her past. That's why I think Gestalt would be far more effective on her, since it makes the patients focus in the present and work on that which troubles them without having to pry into the past, working on that which causes her distress. Again, her defenses will make this hard to even point out, but here is where the specific technique of the empty chair comes into play, which is defined as, quote, technique in which the client conducts an emotional dialogue with some aspect of himself or herself or some significant person who is imagined to be sitting in an empty chair during the session. The client then exchanges chairs takes the role of that aspect or person. We know that a part of her subconscious has taken shape upon her mind, thus having her talk with her inner self in a way she can listen will be more than possible. Something I would like to make clear. For Gestalt, the past is not insignificant, but is not the main focus. If Sima herself wants to talk about her past, it will be worth it with. If she only wants to focus on the present, that is also acceptable. It's all up to her to decide. For now, we know about her attachment to the group, and while she won't admit it, it is obvious Sima cares for the girls a big deal, thus giving the therapy a goal to aim for. How do you want to look after them? And that's it. With this the list is complete. Thank you all for watching, and don't forget to... Wait, there's still time left, and why has the list not vanished yet? Yeah, who am I kidding? This was pretty obvious from the beginning. I wasn't exactly being subtle myself. Absin. Abist. Abusto. Absint. Okay. So yeah, another survival from the Chernobyl incident. While we never get the details, I wouldn't be surprised if it was similar to a regular Christmas for John McLean. With extra depression. As always. The only doctor of a carsman slash police officer, and possibly the only one besides Kami who had a decent relationship with her parents. During the event, Absin shown large amounts of drive and determination, but also a high amount of tactical analysis and strategic planning, seeing how she was able to make it out from her own school and into a police post while also having a couple of broken bones. 
to the point he even added another incursion into Peterheim, and survived with the remnants of the police until Rhodes found her. A survivor by nature, yet heavily impacted by everything which happened in the city, from her mother being caught by Talula's first show of power to retrieving her father's wand from his body, and passing through the following chaos that was the city afterwards. To say she has PTSD and depression would be an understatement, seeing as how she often keeps to herself and often sees little value in her own life. I mean, the very first thing we hear from her is her asking us to do with her as we see fit. While the loss of her parents is already terrible on its own, there is also whatever she witnessed and endured during the following days she spent surviving on her own. To the point she seems to have certain degree of anthropophobia. As she seems wary of people and will outright seem terrified when a large group approaches her, as seen her mission failed dialogue, probably because of what she saw citizens do in order to survive. Of course, this one is at a relatively low level, thus she isn't alright violent in public, but will try to keep her distance and be unnoticed. In her files, we can even see how some members of logistics seem worried by her behavior, noticing how she looks down and tired most of the time. Yet, we can also read that she is also trying to be cordial with others and tries to form bonds with some people. So, that's it. Just someone with depression. Again, depression is not something to take lightly. Second, this is Terra. Of course there's a caveat. Why else would I put her at the bottom? Do you remember that simple thing? The basis of most psychological treatments? The support net? Also known as social support network. It is defined as, quote, the provision of assistance or comfort to others, typically to help them cope with biological, psychological, and social stressors. Support may arise in an interpersonal relationship in an individual social network, involving family members, friends, neighbors, religious institutions, colleagues, caregivers, or support groups. It might take the form of practical help, tangible support that involves giving money or other direct material assistance, and emotional support that allows the individual to feel valued, accepted, and understood." End quote. That simple thing is what kept everyone else away from far more dangerous thoughts. These bonds are what keep Leto being cherry, Istina wanting to learn more, Gomi working hard, Rosa from taking that final step, and Hifzima a purpose. That little thing is completely absent in Abstin's case. Not only is she suffering from PTSD and recurrent depression, she also has shown a certain interest in the gears, asking whatever she can, whenever she can, keeping an eye out for them and dreading the moment she will have to face them. Why? That's the terrifying part. We don't know. Besides her interest in the girls, there is no mention in the archives regarding her reasons behind it. All we know is that she is keeping watch over them, almost as an obsession. And we also know that the girls know what happened to her father. And the girls are not precisely the best at communicating. Just one bad mention of that event in her presence, and anything could happen. This is why she is at the very bottom of the list. The fact absent is such a wild card regarding her thoughts and feelings, and that as far as we know, she is carrying all of this entirely by her own. Granted, we have seen that she has made at least one friend with Peerstream, and hopefully even more as time goes on. But if she happens to have only Peerstream, then I cannot say she has a properly developed security net. Needless to say, that whenever the plot regarding the Ursus girls comes back into the front, Absinthe will be the trigger to the events that might transpire in the present. And I say present because we still lack a part of the story, so have a theory as a bonus. If we ever have another event revolving around the girls, I think it will be about the second part of their survival days. 
the time between Peterheim and Rhodes finding them. Returning to Amsinth, I can suggest a proper treatment as with the rest. Don't take me wrong, therapy to work through her PTSD and depression is obvious, but the information regarding her present thoughts are far too limited to make a more specific diagnosis. For now, and I hate to say this, all we can do is wait for further development. And that's it, for real this time. My analysis of each of the members of the Ursus Students Self-Governing Group. Plus one. Personally, this was quite the experience. Not only was I able to finish this, but also I got to flex a bit of the initial knowledge I have gathered during the last month. Hopefully, making this video far more easy to understand than the previous one. But what do you think? Do you think my diagnosis is off? Should another treatment be used? Leave it in the comments down below. As always, I will love nothing more but to see what we can come with. For now, this has been Dr. Blob, wishing you all a great day. And as always, stay healthy everyone. And I'm never doing a group analysis because oh my nyan.